Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever it is where you're watching this. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and I'm hoping that you're having a great day. The goal of this channel is to take seminary level content and to make it available to anyone, anywhere via YouTube. So if you find these videos informative, do me a small favor, subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up and hit the share button and let somebody else know about this. These small steps really do make a big impact on the videos that YouTube recommends and its algorithms. So thank you very, very much. This video is kind of picking up where we were at last time with the kingdom of heaven in Matthew's gospel. And in Matthew 27, 51, we are told that when Jesus died, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. This passage has been known since the early church as the vellum schism. Vellum for curtain or screen and schism from the Latin verb skindo, which means to cut, tear, or rent. The Latin for this phrase is taken from the Latin text of Mark 15:38. At vellum templi schism, est in duo a sursum usque de ursum. And the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all recount this incident that occurred during Jesus' crucifixion. Since most think that Mark was written first, let's look at how he uses this passage in his account of Jesus' life. The Velm schism forms an inclusio, or sort of a bookend, in Mark's gospel. In Mark chapter 1, verse 10, he tells us that the heavens were split apart at Jesus' baptism. And then the temple veil is split in two at Jesus' death. The Greek is actually clear in the line here, so we have to back up one more language here for this point. In Greek, the verb that is used in both Mark 1.10 and then 1538 is the same, schizo, and it means to tear, to rent, to split apart. In two recent articles by Stephen Mortier and Paul Lamarch, excuse me if I butchered your names there, they show how the Velm schism in Mark's gospel not only brackets the gospel, but in each case they serve a revelatory function. At the baptism, a voice comes out of the split heavens, you are my beloved son. And then chapter 15, immediately after the Velm schism, a centurion who's out at the cross exclaims, truly this man was the son of God. Now Matthew's account is not as clear cut as Mark's use of the Velm schism but I think it's tied to this theme of the kingdom of heaven that we looked at in the last video. And if you haven't seen that, you might want to pause this one and go back and look at that. I'll have a link up here or underneath in the description under this video. But by way of quick summary, or spoiler if you haven't watched that one yet, Matthew is the only book in the Bible to use the phrase kingdom of heaven. And I tried to show how his use of this phrase, rather than the vaguer kingdom of God that's used, in, for example, in Luke, is because of its vertical references. The heaven skies above is where Jesus is from, but now he lives and died here on earth. After his death, he returns to the heavenly realm, and he has all authority over that is above, the heavens and all that there is there, and here on the earth. He is Lord of heaven and earth. And I trace this theme throughout the entire Gospel of Matthew. So what does the Velum Schism have to do with that? And why am I making a separate video on this? The answer to this is because the connection between the tearing of the veil and the kingdom of heaven is not really all that clear in the text itself. And it requires some background information, information that I believe that most of Matthew's original readers would have possessed. But unfortunately, we don't have it today. And we miss this. Temple veils. The Jewish temple was not the only temple in the ancient world to have a veil. In fact, it appears that most of them did. Why? Well, let me draw out a little diagram here to explain this. If you went to the Jewish temple or otherwise, you didn't enter the temple building itself. As a follower of that religion, you would have been relegated to the courtyard around the temple. Access to the inner rooms within the temple was almost always limited to the priests. This is where God resided or manifested himself, Phanio in the Greek. And if you stood in front of the temple there, the Greeks use this preposition pro. And it means in front of or before something. 
Now, if you take the manifestation, the fanyo of God inside and the pro possession outside the temple and we put them together, we get the word profane. This is the area where those who were not priests could stand, but it was not a good location in case you saw into the temple. And if you were to see into the temple itself, this was an irreverent and sacrilegious act. It was profane. So how do you keep eyes that don't belong there out of the temple? Well, you hang a veil or a curtain to obscure the view. So you would have a veil over the outer doors to keep people from seeing it. Second Chronicles 3.8 describes what was inside the temple or the inner room of the temple. This was overlaid with gold, according to 2 Chronicles 3.8, and the Ark of the Covenant was kept in an inner room. There was a second veil behind which the Ark of the Covenant was kept, and this was called the Holy of Holies. So you actually had two spaces inside the Jewish temple. Later Jewish texts add that Aaron's rod, a pot of manna, and the anointing oil was also kept within the Holy of Holies. However, all of these treasures were taken away when Jerusalem was sacked and destroyed at the start of the Babylonian captivity. And we need to remember that during Jesus' day, the temple that they visited and worshipped at was built by Herod the Great. Construction on this temple started around 20 BC. So when Jesus and the disciples go up to Jerusalem, the temple that they saw was only 50 years old at the very most. And of particular note, especially for those studying the New Testament, it did not contain the Ark of the Covenant. The space behind the second veil would have been an empty space or an empty room. The other big question or point of debate that seems almost impossible to resolve is whether there was one veil or two veils in the Jewish temple. Now, most of the texts that describe the temple during Jesus' day describe an outer veil that screened the doors of the temple. Then others describe that there was a second veil as well within the main room of the temple that separated the main room from the Holy of Holies, the space behind the veil. And the New Testament doesn't help us out here as well. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that the veil was torn. That's it. Is it the outer veil or the inner veil? Was there one or two? We're not told. And finally, some texts seem to indicate that the inner veil was actually two curtains that overlapped with about a 30 inch space between them. So that a priest could enter on one side, walk between the veils, and then into the Holy of Holies. This way, the veil would never be pulled back. And just to throw one more detail in here in case you haven't had enough, there would have been more than one veil. While one hung within the temple, a second was kept folded up. And when the one that was hanging got dirty or was defiled in some way or manner, they would take it down and hang up the one that was already clean and prepared. The first one was then washed and purified again. The Talmud recounts for us that this job required 300 priests to perform because the veil was that big and heavy. If we take all the ancient evidence into account, then the best guess is that the temple had one veil in front of the main doors and another one within the temple itself to separate the inner room of the temple and the Holy of Holies. Now, Josephus wasn't just a historian, but he was also a priest. And he gives us perhaps one of the most detailed descriptions of this inner veil. In the Jewish Wars, he writes, the temple had a door 55 cubits high and 16 broad. Before these hung a veil of equal length of Babylonian tapestry with embroidery of blue and fine linen, of scarlet also and purple, wrought with marvelous skill. Nor was this mixture of materials without its mystic meaning. It typified the universe. For the scarlet seemed emblematic of fire, the fine linen of earth, the blue of the air, and the purple of the sea. The comparison in two cases being suggested by their color, and that of fine linen and purple by their origin as one is produced by the earth and the other by the sea. On this tapestry was portrayed a panorama of the heavens, the signs of the zodiac expected, and this is because the signs of the zodiac would have depicted people or animals. The innermost recess measured 20 cubits and was screened in like manner from the outer portion by a veil. So you see he's talking about two veils here. In this stood nothing whatever, 
unapproachable, inviolable, invisible to all. It was called the Holy of Holies. This is perhaps one of the best or most detailed descriptions of the veils and the temple that we have from close to the time of Christ. Josephus' accounts are often questionable, but his description of the temple coheres fairly well with other accounts, so it's probably a pretty accurate report. This inner veil also would have been very valuable. When Rome sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Roman general Titus took one of these veils back to Rome, and the Jewish rabbis recount seeing it in Rome. For Josephus, the temple represented creation. The main room of the temple represented the earth. The Holy of Holies represented heaven. The outer parts represented the sea and the land. The third part thereof, to which the priests were not admitted, is, as it were, heaven, peculiar to God. Both Philo and Josephus, Jewish authors from around the time of Christ, both mentioned that the colors used in the veil represented the four elements that constituted all of creation earth, air, fire, and water. The scarlet thread represented the fire, the blue was the air, the purple was the sea, that is, water, and the white linen represented the earth, in which the flax had grown. At the same time, the embroidered design on the veil depicted the sun, the moon, the stars, and the other heavenly bodies. But not the signs of the zodiac, as I mentioned, because they would have represented human or animal representations, so the temple veil represented this incredible work of art, but it was also sensitive to the needs and teachings of the Jewish religion. The veil within the temple was a symbolic boundary between heaven and earth. Okay, back to Matthew and the Velm Schism in Matthew 27, 51. Just then the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split apart. The tombs were opened and the bodies of many saints who had died were raised. Now, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were extremely terrified and said, this truly was God's son. In Matthew's account, when the temple veil is torn, the boundary between heaven and earth is rent. And this fits right in with what I've been saying about Matthew's use of the kingdom of heaven or heaven and earth throughout his gospel. Matthew presents Jesus as Lord of heaven and earth from the first chapter to the last. His life, ministry, and death reveals the kingdom of God to us, but also mediates between heaven and earth. At his death, the Velm Schism symbolically depicts this. This separation between the heavenly realm and the earthly is rent within the temple. The kingdom of heaven is now influencing and impacting the earthly realm, through the risen Lord and the church that is commissioned with this task. And I think Matthew's readers would have been familiar with the descriptions that Josephus gives about the temple, information that we may have lost today. But when they heard the text read, they would have seen that the Velm Schism is indicating that the barrier between heaven and earth has been rent with Jesus' life, ministry, and death, and especially his resurrection. Okay. That was a little deep this time, and I think I'm gonna leave it there. Till we meet again, peace.